while, rainy afternoon where I am. Hope it's better where you are. Um, I'm Becky, I'm a reader in fine art and I am I'm part of the Space and Place group and I've been working with Luke and with the um, Higher Education Research Cluster on putting together these set of events around changing campus. Um, as Luke said, we are recording. Uh, we're going to record uh, the uh, presentations and the discussions um, in two separate blocks for ease um, and to uh, manage consent should there be any issues around recording. Oh, sorry, got my alarm on. Now, hang on, has that moved on? Okay, so I'm um, delighted to have everybody here. Um, our speakers today uh, are Haral Patel uh, from Cardiff, talking about ali aligning learning space, learning and space, as uh, Leila, uh, Leila Garib and James from SHU, talking about uh, part of the furniture and design studio. And we're very happy to have Justine Pegler, who's also joining us to talk about some, uh, to give some insights into some very new um, early stage research. Um, hang on one second, I think I've got my email left on. I'll deal, I'll deal with it in a minute. So I'm gonna set the scene briefly uh, about what's led us to these set of events uh, and also throw out some uh, somewhat um, mischievous thoughts before we start. So this is a collaboration, these series of events on changing campus are a collaboration between the Space and Place Group and the HEC, the Interdisciplinary Higher Education Research Cluster. This is a kind of new partnership. It's really interesting to bring together two existing groups and see where your interests overlap. I'm gonna ask Luke very briefly to introduce the Space and Place group because it is his baby. And then I'm going to ask Helen Parkin to briefly introduce the heck. If you were here last time, I apologize for the replication, um, but I think it's really good for those people who've not joined us before. So Luke. Thank you, Becky. Yeah, uh, Shoe Space and Place Group has existed for about a decade. It's a very loose um, federation of uh, fellow souls uh, who um, come together to discuss different ways of researching space and place, often from a sort of qualitative and uh, artsy uh, perspective, but not exclusively so. All are welcome to contribute. People tend to contribute on a revolving door basis. Each year we choose a theme uh, and this year's theme is changing places uh, and we've developed this sub theme of the changing campus um, and getting quite a bit of good traction on that. Uh, I will say because it seems opportune to mention it now that we have in in prospect or in plan um, a third changing campus event probably in May. Uh, Carol Taylor, who was due to be one of the keynote speakers today um, from University of Bath, is not able to join us today, but we hope to get her along in May. And we have a couple of other um, speakers um, also uh, being lined up who are interested in joining a third iteration of this particular strand of the Changing uh, Places theme. So uh, back to you, Becky. Um, have I just lost my screen? Uh, you've gone out of presenter mode and you're oh, now okay. in... Uh, Faffing with my email to make it stop. Apologies. So, um, Helen, would you like to introduce the Higher Education Research Cluster for us? Yeah, thanks, Becky and Luke. Um, so, the Higher Edu Education Research and Practice Cluster is a fairly recently established group, um, open to anyone across the university with an interest in uh, higher education research or practice. Um, what we're doing, or what we're trying to do, is bring together lots of different groups, um, promote what's going on across those groups. Um, we have got a team site where we're hoping that most of the activity will occur. Um, so uh, the space and place group has their own section within the team site. There's lots of different uh, groups that we've got set up. So we've got a reading group, we've got a peer review group, um, there's a space for people to discuss student engagement, uh, higher education policy and practice. 
Uh, so lots and lots of different things going on all under this umbrella. It's not particularly owned or run by any area of the university, but we do have a very small amount of administrative support in SETL, which is student, the Directorate of Student Experience Teaching and Learning. So um, if you are interested in being involved in the group, um, please do email us. There is a, an email address, which is quite complicated, uh, exclamation mark, interdisciplinary higher education research practice cluster. Um, so uh, I think if you do exclamation mark and interdisciplinary, you'll find us. Um, so yeah, please uh, feel free to email us and we'll add you to the group so that you can find out what we're doing. Thank you so much, Helen. So last week, sorry, last session, Luke, I, I've screen grabbed this from Luke cheekily. So Luke's crazy face is stuck there at the top. Um, quite amuse me. Um, Luke began the series of Changing Places events with uh, talking, framing it around Lefebvre's uh, spatial triad. Some of you remember this and the conceived space of the university, the way it kind of imagines itself and communicates itself, the perceived space, the interpretations of staff and students, and the lived space, the actual in inhabitants of that space. And I'm particularly interested in these sessions in looking at that third one. However, before we go there, one of the th problems, I, I'm quite a fan of Lefebvre's spatial triad, except it doesn't account for the fact um, it's all about how we are perceiving and living and conceiving. Um, obviously, humans are fairly more active than your average sofa or chair, although James might well disagree with me and Leila. However, what, what Lefebvre's spatial triad doesn't account for is space talking back or materials talking back. And I'm using talking kind of broadly here and not everything is obviously about verbal language um, but it, it, it connects up with a whole group of um, ways that space might be communicating back to us and I'm kind of muddling space and material and object here because I think we, we when we think about particular spaces we're often talking about the things that are in those spaces or their placeness but yeah space community the things that we find, it's not all about how we define them. Sometimes there's a fair amount of um, uh, interrelating back. And obviously this has become a really, really extensively theorised area of work that draws together, um, I guess, oh, hang on, I guess, we'll get to them in a minute, that gets a, um, a effect theory and um, uh, kind of interaction theory, actor network theory, um, process theory. There's a whole realm of stuff that has kind of come with a huge force in the last 20 years or so that looks at the way the material world speaks back to us. Um, but there's lots of different nooks and crannies of that. And, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a theoretician, I'm a practitioner, so I'm going to um, slip the noose of, be, of offering you a, a an extensive characterization of that theoretical terrain because it's huge right now. Um, but um, so I just want to talk about some ways that things talk back just to frame it before we lead into the, um, the presentation. So my, some of my, my favorite uh, ways to think about how things and materials and spaces talk back to us is to think about these people who are of course, Dr. Zeus's thing one and thing two. And it's like Dr. Zeus, um, you know, he was the champion. He, he saw all effect theory and interaction theory coming and got there before it. Um, thing one and two, peculiar, non-human, non-animal, don't know what they are, entities that kind of disorder everything and mess with all the ideas and orderly things that we might want to do with the world and run around and stop us grabbing them. Um, and they, um, they're, they're kind of great, great champions, I think. Um, another version of that, instead of giving you text slides, I'm giving you image slides. So uh, The Blob, uh, a film that terrified me more than any other film as I was a child. But the fantastic thing about The Blob is that many of you will not remember it or even heard of it. Um, and I think I only remember it second time round. But The Blob were these kind of space blobs that came, sent by aliens, and if you touch them, they like joined with you and it wasn't clear whether they sucked you in or you sucked them in or, but they kind of disrupted the perimeters of the, the, the human, non-human uh, divide 
Um, and I, I think there's lots of things in the, the way at which we attempt to research um, the ways that our, our spaces and places mess with us and blur the boundary between subject and object that the blob always seems to symbolize for me. Um, I, want, I just put up a few other images, um, simple ways to think about the interaction of how spaces and places talk back. In a, in a very simple way, they are legible and they record our interaction. These are not Hallam, but they are other institutional spaces taken with close-up cameras. Some of them could well be Hallam. Um, those shiny Lefebvrean um, perceived and conceived spaces, once you look at them close up, they're not so shiny and so controlled. Um, so in a way, the material is always already um, undoing the, the visioning and rhetorical work of spaces. Um, couldn't resist these two, sorry, Lou. But, um, um, we are always changing the material of the spaces. And sometimes, like thing one and thing two, they are somewhat um, mischievous. So the image on the left is a, a bit of the hoarding that the building construction team built at Hallam around the atrium. But they used a bit of existing signage from somewhere else to patch in a weird hole. And it gives us this harm in the middle of the hoarding, which is just, uh, um, you know, the construction team are doing their job to um, keep the space safe, but unbeknown to them or unnoticed by them, those little bits of, um, of signage are, are doing something somewhat mischievous um, What at the same time. Equally, um, meet the person who is responsible for your safety is supposed to be this nice moral command around the building site at Hallam. Of course, someone's put this lovely face on it. Um, the material itself is given an affordance for a whole lot of um, play. Obviously, a human has done that, but the, the, those materials have allowed it. Um, things and spaces come apart, that, you know, that in the, the, the attempt to vision and build and make learning spaces, things are often coming apart, being built. Um, these are images of the pile of rubble. That was learning spaces disaggregated. Um, it has its own amazing magic. It gives us insight into what learning is made of, um, what's valuable, how it changes. The images on the right are when they took down um, uh, the poem, the Andrew Motion poem, and put it back up. An amazing bit of care. Um, they're, they're very uh, moments where the material and the practice of materials uh, are communicating some amazing things. Um, equally, spaces and things interact with the movement of time. And I think this is perhaps one of the most mischievous things that happens with buildings and spaces. So these are um, two images, you might recognize them from Hallam. One says the possibility of new and the other says, hello future. Um, now already these things, it's arguable whether they ever conveyed the future, but now with a whole different set of structures of feeling around them, the, the spirit of the time, they start to mean different things altogether. Um, so how time interacts with material um, also seems to me quite mischievous. I've, I've flagged up Raymond Williams there. This is my only bit of theory. I'm gonna add, gonna chuck into this because there's so much effect theory. That I thought I would kind of go back to um, some Raymond Williams from the 70s. So you don't have to read all this right now, but it's a beaut it's, it's on a blog by uh, Gabriela Pereira, who is talking about Williams and saying um, that he's trying to catch the lived reality of social experience and uses this very structure of feeling, which is not the most fashionable bit of effect theory. In fact, it's somewhat forgotten, but it seems to me one of the most useful things to capture um, how we're trying to get at the material and the immaterial creates our lived experience. And it, she's actually talking about color, rhythms and shapes. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm just gonna finish with this nice quote from Master Leslie, who is writing about the German chemical industry here. But she just asked us a question and said, through thinking about matter and materials and qualities and aspects, might we get closer to what, what experience is and given that universities ne really need to understand how learning spaces are being experienced, this seems to me like my, my uh, calling card here to uh, introduce all of these three projects and also to argue 
uh, and open up the ways that we attempt to gather student experience and staff experience. Right, I'm done. I'm going to hand over to Haral. Um, Haral, would you introduce yourself? Because to quote Luke, you can definitely do it better than I can. Yes, sure, thanks. And hand over. Thanks, Becky. Hello, everybody. I'm Hiral Patel. I'm from Cardiff University. I'm a lecturer in architecture. And before coming to Cardiff um, in 2019, I was at University of Reading um, in the School of Construction Management and Engineering. So quite interesting shift in terms of the disciplines. Um, I will start my presentation. I've, uh, I've also put in the chat uh, a link to Padlet. I thought that would be quite nice to capture your reactions and reflections as I go along. Um, and yeah, uh, it, it would be a good sort of tangible outcome from, from, from this event. Um, I hope you're seeing the slideshow. Uh, yes, okay, great. Yes. Okay, so um, yes. I, let me see if I can move this thing more. Okay, so I started off my, my sort of journey in academia in 2012. Uh, before that, I was a project manager. Uh, and before that, I was an architect. Uh, I was practicing as, as an architect. I'm still probably am an architect. But, um, and when I was a, I, when I shifted to project management, um, I was given this project of a, a fairly new uh, flagship building that was completed. And I had the fun job of dealing with snags after the, after the practical completion. So for those who are not aware of snags, they are like list of things that are that either like um, faults or issues that remains to be resolved after you are basically given the keys as, as the occupiers. Um, so the contractual liability has finished, but uh, in a way you are still sort of resolving all the mistakes. And it was a long list and I was able to deal with issues around construction workmanship sort of issues and maintenance related issues. Those were easy to fix. The one that was very difficult to fix was the design related issues and uh, one of the one of the person who I was working with in the, from the user group said, oh, we will have to just live with this. Um, I don't think we can go and fix this. And that was really um, a kind of a, a surprise, not surprise, but, but, a, but a moment for me to, to think about uh, what happens to buildings after they are used? Because before that, I was solely focused on delivering the building, and that that it is, that's the end point for me. But then I realized that it's it's there's a whole life that happens after the buildings are finished, and um, that's where I started off um, with my PhD, which was to look at one building after it was finished in 1963, which is the library building at Reading University, and see its journey over 50 years. And, and that was really, really great uh, experience. Um, but one of the ways in which we could study buildings uh, in use is through building performance evaluations, um, which within the sector, uh, which in, within the architectural profession or construction industry more broadly are not common, unfortunately. Um, this is a, this is a report uh, from 2017, so it's slightly dated, but I don't think the picture would have changed drastically, but it says only 9% of architectural practices offered post-occupancy evaluation as a service. So there's real gap in terms of the capability and, and the skills, um, but also none of this uh, practices generate any revenue from POE. So there, there's nobody sort of paying for, for this service. And one of the problems about, about that is because it's, kind of in a blurred boundary, where, where, do, where does POE sit, whether it is within the supply side, and for them there is the risk of uh, claims and, and liability if, if uh, defects are discovered, or whether it is in the demand side, so the client organizations trying to understand how their buildings are performing. So it sits in this sort of weird uh, boundary between, between the two. 
And there's also issues around procurement and, and PI insurance. Um, and this might sound really sort of untheoretical, but going back to Becky's uh, uh, kind of um, statement, she made that she's a practitioner and not theoretician. I think it's it's kind of uh, both inform each other. And there are, there are serious issues around how we are procuring buildings. Are we procuring them as fixed objects or are we procuring them as, as a more sort of outcomes and performance? Um, so, that, and, and there's also sort of more theoretical challenge here because the knowledge about how buildings are used is distributed between different academic disciplines. And so we really need to bring that that sort of different disciplinary perspectives into, into discussions with, with each other. Um, but fundamentally, the, the, one of the problems with current practice of post-occupancy evaluation is that of environmental determinism. A um, lot of approaches to post-occupancy evaluation uh, are looking at firstly buildings as this fixed unmutable objects, uh, as technical objects. And they exaggerate the influence of physical environment um, by saying um, space will define how you behave in, in a particular, particular, yeah, or the, or the architecture will define how you behave. Um, it focuses on direct effects of behave, on behavior, which can be observed. Um, and people are often thought of as passive. Um, now this is kind of, quite contrast with what Becky was saying, but I'll, I'll come back to, to her, um, her comment around buildings having, having agency. Um, so, so in terms of critiquing POE, uh, post-occupancy evaluation, the, this is the contribution that, that I sort of made from my uh, PhD is, is to really think about buildings as not fixed objects, but at socio material practices. And by considering them as socio material practices, we are giving agency to both the material objects as well as, as to people. And it's, it's sort of, um, it's sort of agencies negotiated. Um, and this draws from Anne-Marie Mole's work, uh, which has influences from actor network theory, but she has, uh, she has not uh, said that she is kind of within that camp. So it's slightly, slightly different than actor network theory. Um, but she uh, has uh, taken, she has developed this praxeographic approach, which is a, a mapping of practices, a story of practices. And her argument is that on the right here, you can see um, there is this object in the middle, and then you have different perspectives to those objects. And that is a kind of uh, social construction of technology view. And what she is saying is that uh, that's not the case. With each perspective, we are creating a new object. And somehow these different objects kind of hang together or they contrast with each other, they complement with each other. And um, these objects come into being uh, during the enactment, uh, which, is an, uh, which is the practice involving multiple entities, not just uh, a particular entity, but different heterogeneous entities comes together and, they, uh, and the object is made in, in that um, action or in that practice. So that's sort of her, her theory, which I, which I kind of, um, used for making sense of all the data that I was I was gathering for for the library building. So this is the library building uh, from University of Reading. It uh, was built in 1960s. And when I started doing field work in 2013, uh, the building hadn't changed. This particular view hadn't changed much. And you would think that 50 years have gone and something would have changed. But it was, I mean, there were a few changes here and there, but more or less it was, it was the same from ex externally. Um, internally, it, it was completely different. And that kind of uh, shows how users were in, engaging with, uh, with the interior spaces. So this is a floor plan uh, outline of, of that building. So there's like a book stack at the back. So if, this is a book stack over here in the middle, that is staircase and the exhibition hall. And these are the reading rooms at the front. So, so that's the sort of floor plan. And in, by using Anne-Marie Mole's uh, sort of practices uh, as, as, a, as a lens, I then focused on three kind of 
key practices which were in which the library as an object was emerging. So one was issuing a book, the second was using a table, and the third was making an exhibition. Um, I just wanted to kind of quickly show the, the methods and the kind of data that I collected because it was a combination of ethnographic and archival research combined together for over and I did data collection for one and a half years, so it, it was quite uh, an immersed uh, process. So the building itself was a big source of information. The bindery in the library, by some chance, had uh, had kept hold of the original drawings. I interviewed lots of uh, current staff and students, but I also went to the homes of the retired members of library staff, uh, library uh, the staff members and uh, interviewed them in their homes. In the states department, there was, uh, there was a whole big box of documents around an extension that was built in the library. Given that the library is really good at recording documents, uh, they, they had their own sort of uh, newsletters and ephemera sort of catalogued, um, which I which I got hold of. And by complete serendipity, I discovered this big archive of, of university, um, university archives, and this were not related to the buildings. This was librarians' archives, this was vice chancellor's archive, uh, archival documents. So but they gave uh, they gave a great insight into the life uh, that was happening inside the building. There was a construction project going on, so I kind of shadowed and followed the, the project team as, as they were modifying the building. I sat in a lot of meetings, and this is like a plan of a table and various people sort of around it, and me kind of just sitting there as an as in kind of trying to be invisible and not kind of, yeah, um, just listening to what people were discussing. There were there were library newsletters. Um, there were artifacts. So, for instance, this book here shows um, has got uh, remains of different issuing systems. So there was the stamp, and then there came the punch card, and then there was the barcode. So the, the artifacts were kind of in a way recording different systems that were used um, in the library. I shadowed uh, students. I just hanged around, following them. <laughs> it may sound a bit creepy but but they but yeah just uh silently uh following them I, I mean yeah they and then I did interviews with them just to understand what they were doing and they kindly let me follow them throughout uh throughout their time in the library um again archives dispersed in different locations and then an exhibition here um which I'll talk in, uh, in detail later but with all these different data sets I think uh I was creating a, a different identity of myself in the field work, and uh, and it was it was quite an emotional experience as well. So we did uh, in this publication we did talk about um, different identities of of researcher and how that affects uh, the data that is collected. And in the archive, um, I, I found this. Um, kind of scribbles from vice chancellor on the meeting agenda. Um, and uh, in 1958, and that is about say five to six years before the library building was opened, but the design of the building started back in 1949. So it's just midway somewhere where they actually got money and, and so let's go for it. Um, and this, the discussion is what is what is the library? Is it, is it a bookstore or is it a reading room? How many readers do we need? How many books do we need? And are they all kind of silent seated people or are they kind of undergraduate students? So the, this kind of tension between what or what is a library, the ontological question was kind of bothering them then. And I think that same question is still kind of very re relevant and continuous, uh, continuously being asked as to what is a library. Um, and here we can see the two merging because it's, it's quite interesting, the shelf and, and the desk kind of coming together. And, and I thought this was really interesting representation of uh, merging the bookstore and the reading room. Um, but in my in my data, what I found is that library was not one thing. Uh, it was multiple. So it's a book stack, reading rooms, workplace for staff, cafe, a statistic in the annual report, uh, a score on national student survey, a venue for exhibitions, um, an itinerary on the open day tour. Um, it was 
I also found some photographs where students did graffiti and um, was, a, was a place for them to protest and, and demonstrate. Um, and then after 50 years, that suddenly it becomes a site of heritage and, and uh, we need to preserve the, the heritage. Um, and also it's, it's square meters recorded on the university space management database. So there, there, there is always this tension going on between these different versions of the, of the library. And um, the first uh, idea of Anne-Marie Moll that the library emerges in the enactment uh, or in the practices of issuing a book. So before I started fieldwork, I didn't realize um, how important is this practice of movement of books for, for the library. And here you can see that there's a desk. Uh, this is from 1974, the, the, this floor changed drastically. But there is, a, there is a security check here, which creates that boundary. And uh, that's where the library stops in a way. Um, and it, it, is, it is to monitor the movement of books and things like slips and cards and stamps and all of those come together along with these glass screens and desks and the building to create what, uh, what a library is. So, so in a way, a library is an enactment of, of different uh, heterogeneous entities coming together. But it is all, the physical book and the physical building also enacts the users uh, in a way. So this is a book from my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, Will Hughes. And this book is available as a physical book on the shelf in the library, and it is available as an ebook. If you are a member of public within certain periods of the year, you can go to the shelf and you can access the physical book and read it. If uh, if you if you if that book is doesn't exist and then you have to go to ebook, but then ebook is only restricted to members of Re University of Reading. So by having a book on the shelf, it allows members of public to just go and access that that knowledge and it's it, the materiality does play a role in in the in enacting who the users are. Um, the second uh, enactment that I studied was using a table and I was, um, I was pleasantly surprised by this humble table which had survived 50 years uh, while the whole building was kind of moved and extended and, and the floors were ripped, ripped off and, and, and all, all the other changes happening. And the, the table was uh, kind of adapted slightly. So you can see a small hole here, which is to uh, put a lock around your laptop. So that wasn't the case in 1960s, but in, in 2014. And, the, and then there are sockets here on the, on the kind of um, the sill of the window. And that is to provide power for, for laptops uh, that are on the table. Um, and what was observed is that students uh, would, if one student is sitting here, others don't feel comfortable to come and sit on just opposite them. And um, the occupancy or the utilization was, was kind of uh, lower. And so they added this divider here and retopped the, the, the table and added a lamp just to improve the lighting. And, and the table sort of continues, continues to live on. And in my observations of, of using that table, I, I drew uh, from, from Goffman in terms of how, um, how different territories are created, uh, which some of which involve the material sort of material objects and material things, but others are more sort of um, personal space. So you just don't want to sit facing directly a stranger. You, you are okay to sit side by side, but not directly facing with each other. And we can see all of these different territories in play uh, when somebody is using that, that table. But the table is also a, a sort of a fire object. Um, and in a way, a table in the library is connected to the student's room or the student's accommodation. And um, when I was interviewing the users, what they told me was that it, the space on the table is sort of um, something that they don't have a clear space, a clear desk is something they don't have in their room because there's always things on top of it. So, so that's why it's, it's quite valuable for them. The lighting is, is very good. And there are other people uh, there who motivate them, um, which are not there in their accommodation. There's no bed 
to distract them and, and making them go to sleep. There's no food and drink to distract them, then no YouTube. And other people make sure that you don't watch YouTube or TV when you are in the library because they, they are sort of uh, keeping a check on you. So the absence uh, of, of this uh, these things um, in the accommodation is what makes the table more durable because this is still in demand and very much used. Um, and then comes to the exhibition or exhibiting in the library, the third enactment. And that's where we can really see the ontological politics of what a library is playing out. So in 1960s, when the library opened, there was a whole uh, program of exciting exhibitions uh, often conducted in collaboration with staff and students. It's part of their learning experience. Um, and Beckett collection, which some of you might know uh, is, is quite, uh, kind of emerged, a quite prominent collection, it emer uh, emerged from one of these exhibitions in the library, so uh, the Samuel Beckett collection. Um, but over time, because what is a library? Is it a place for storing books and studying? So that's what took over this space, and you can see sort of desk and shelves coming in. And then when the, there are more ebooks now available, and there are offsite stores, and there's uh, there's collaboration between different libraries to to discard some of the books and just store a copy in, in the Central British Library repository. That all meant that the number of books in the building could be reduced, and we could have that uh, space uh, again a, as an exhibition hall. However, just having that space is not enough. We still need to have. Uh, funding for staff members and students to come together and curate exhibitions. So it still needs um, um, sort of organizational support to, to do that. And um, uh, during the field work, I got a chance to curate 50 years of library in the library on 50th anniversary of the library, which was quite exciting. Um, but in a way, um, it also is an example of how the, the structure of the building or, or the structure of the space defines uh, how you can curate or create a, a interactions to exchange knowledge. I mean, this, um, this also, also demonstrates the future of library, which is around objects and interactions with objects um, as more and more content is available digital. Um, so having said all this and coming back to Becky's um, sort of practitioner theor theoretician sort of movement, it's so what, so what with all this? And so this has an implication on how we think about campus and there are three things. So campus is not just physical object, but it's, it comprises of heterogeneous entities. Uh, campus is, uh, is not a fixed object, but emerging in socio-material practices. And it's not a single object, but it has got different sort of aspects which hang together. And here you see um, on the right, um, current sort of propositional visual uh, representation of, of campus as an ecosystem. And it is, uh, it is this physical and digital infrastructure, the staff and student communities, um, which are the sort of cultural elements uh, and, and the values. And then blended learning are the practices of, of learning and agile working are the practices of, of working in a way. And they are in a way linked to the broader aspects here. So the physical digital infrastructure is linked to the urban context within which the university uh, buildings sit, as well as the broader virtual infrastructure that is uh, that is available with, with some repositories being open to public and some being sort of closed off. Um, the, the staff and student communities exist within the broader uh, kind of ecosystem of communities and, and that's where civic university or the civic mission of the university plays, plays a role in connecting, uh, connecting different communities together. Um, agile working uh, is really about what aspirations we have for knowledge and scholarship and how, how do we nurture and, and, and develop those, those aspirations. And blended working really needs to go to rethink is our HE model fit for the challenges that we are facing. It, it's a more systemic issue that we need to connect to. Um, and I sort of 
I'm keen to operate between on the threshold of theory and practice, because for me, both are important and mutually sort of um, enriching each other. And so one of the uh, projects that I was involved in was uh, horizon scanning of future research, uh, future research themes for higher education design quality forum. So identifying where there are knowledge gaps and trying to sort of um, identify those those areas. And we had we had observed six themes. One was a higher education uh, models in the UK and how they need to change probably impact of AI and robotics on uh, on learning methods. Um, although this uh, shift from teaching to learning sounds dated, but we haven't really achieved that uh, in terms of student centered learning. So so we just I just kind of added that theme because we really need to go go into that. Uh, what new learning modes and methods might emerge uh, and diversity within HE sector. This is, yes, um, diversity of students, but also diversity of disciplines and diversity of different institutions, because not each all institutions are same, they, they are uh, different. And lastly, but very important is how we value higher education and, and then by implication, it's, it's physical spaces. Um, Again, to coming back to theory and practice, uh, the method we used to for this project was engage scholarship, uh, which is to get together uh, practitioners uh, and uh, and sort of um, people who are kind of thought leaders and researchers together to shape those themes. Um, and uh, these are these are the photographs from our events uh, that we ran, but we we used various engagement methods to to create those themes. Um, I've also been recently doing a, a, a survey around aligning learning and space. And this survey, the purpose of this survey was to identify what capabilities exist um, within current within our sector to align learning and space, and what processes exist. Um, and this comes from the HEDQF uh, report because we found that th there was a gap in, in terms of aligning learning with space. And what we found, uh, well, it, this is not representative at all, um, but uh, what we found was that capabilities are distributed within an institution and hence active effort needs to be done to bring them together. Um, and capabilities for alignment neither exist in a state's department or education development unit. So we need to really find a place for those capabilities. Um, while there is some provision to align learning and space for academics, there was almost nothing for a state's department, which was uh, quite concerning. And um, while curriculum is constantly evolving and the processes around aligning learning and space happens when there are new buildings uh, being designed or refurbishment projects happening or when, when new programs are being approved, it's not a business as usual activity which goes on alongside curriculum reviews um, on an ongoing basis. So to kind of um, respond to this challenge, I have been uh, developing a framework, Learning Space Aligner tool, uh, which brings together five views of curriculum, the one that's in the handbook, the one enacted in the class, the ex one experienced by students. These two have been added um, more recently as experienced by prospective students and alumni once they graduate from the program. And it uses service design concepts to, to really have a forum for discussion around what are our current uh, teaching and learning practices and how can we, um, how can we, or where we want to go next, where do we want to go in the future? And it brings together a kind of virtual and physical infrastructure in discussion as well. So I'm currently uh, seeking pilot projects. So if, uh, Shu is interested, or if you know of other uh, other projects that might be interested in this, uh, more than welcome to to get in touch. I've been setting up this repository in a way. It's it's kind of a network, but a knowledge learning network uh, with some resources, but people kind of getting together, and and really pushing uh, the agenda for uh, for collecting knowledge around the university spaces. And um, there, there are like podcasts, um, which, which you can look at. 
have, well, we have started putting together some case studies. Um, we've got about five, but we have created a template which we think can be used to compare different case studies. So again, um, I'm hoping that we can develop that um, in future. Um, and Leader Lab is, is a master's in architectural design course. Uh, and um, th that is kind of quite key in, in kind of testing some of these ideas and, and, um, and pushing them forward. And these are the overview of student projects uh, from the Leader Lab. Um, some students are looking at the fifth generation learning spaces kind of quite advanced in terms of the fusion between the physical and the virtual. Um, on the other hand, uh, some students are looking at civic university and taking a network approach to the HE model and what, what would that mean? Uh, also biodiversity um, and, and how, do we, how do we connect human uh, and nature and, and kind of on, on campus? Um, social learning in terms of what does that mean and how can we facilitate, uh, facilitate that? Uh, and kind of more immediate concerns around the future of lecture theater or, or the future of the library and particularly the physical book is something that, that we are looking at. Um, so where next from here? And I've got this long quote, but I think it's quite important. So I will read this. Um, it's by Yuval Noah, Noah Harari, uh, 21 Lessons from 21st Century. Uh, and he says, the industrial revolution has bequeathed us the production line theory of education. In the middle of the town, there is a large concrete building divided into many identical rooms, each room equipped with rows of desks and chairs. At the sound of a bell, you go to one of these rooms together with 30 other kids who were all born the same year as you. Every hour, some grown up walks in and starts, uh, and starts talking. They are all paid to do so by the government. One of them tells you about the shape no, of the bell. Okay, I'll go slow. One of them tells you about the shape of the earth, another tells you about the human past, and a third tells you about the human body. It is easy to laugh at this model and almost everybody agrees that no matter its past achievements, it is now bankrupt. But so far we haven't created a viable alternative. So hopefully uh, through discussions like the ones that we are having now, we can, um, we can push uh, some of the push this agenda forward uh, and really rethink uh, from inside out uh, from from the spaces to the, the he model um, thank you thank you so much Haral. that was absolutely brilliant um i think i am um, grinned my face off all the way through it um thank you i'm just checking the questions um we're going to have uh, a short 10 minutes for questions, Max. Um, and then, um, you know, hopefully we can have a bit of time to pull, some, to pull together some questions. Um, I'm just looking, we've got a question from Luke Man there that I will bring in in a second. Um, just wave if you've got a question. Um, I, I, I had one that you kind of anticipated that, I, I mean, just as you were saying, you used the slide business as usual. That was exactly what was on my lips. And I, I, um, I really um, was taken by how well you constructed this sort of um, multiple object. And I, you know, I, I haven't seen Amaral, Amory Mull applied like that. I, I really fascinated by its application to building from from body if you like um but that kind of sense of a building as a sort of multiple object with many many different objects wrapped in it when you come what what you know i can see that you're like really clear sighting sightedly trying to um speak to kind of adapt what you know of this into a kind of to be a, um to make tools that can speak to the way the university is constructing the object of the learning space. But I, I just wonder, um, you know, what's lost in doing that? Um, you know, it's it's a it's a, a really important manoeuvre, but also a slightly painful one. Um, I 
I'm, if you may, I might just frame it as uh, rather than lost in doing that, I think I'm getting more enriched by doing that in a way. Um, because um, I think practice uh, is messy, uh, but practice is full of opportunities. And I see it in, in that way is um, what is a, because I, I have this practitioner background, um, I was kind of inclined to think uh, in terms of what is lost, uh, what is sort of um, what I'm doing can be applied. And rather than getting lost, I think what I have found is that the experience bit, which is something that Anne-Marie Moll doesn't cover, is something that is quite important. And that is probably a contribution that could be made to Anne-Marie Moll's theory in terms of, and she also acknowledges that in her later work of how practices can also be thought alongside experiences. Um, so practices as doing, but experiences as feelings. And um, so I, I think um, for me, both are mutually enri enriching and um, there, there are constraints uh, of operation in both. I mean, we can't theorize in, in however way we want. Similarly, we can't practice in however way we want. So there are constraints for both. I mean. But it's a journey, I think, and I'm I'm just started, so it's probably too soon to answer the question as well. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Lutman in. Uh, there's a question there from Lutman. There's, some, there's a whole load of points as well that are really interesting here. Um, but I can see a clear question from Lutman and a question from James. Um, oh. Yeah, uh, some great points as well that I wouldn't want you to miss. But um, Lutman, are you there? Do you want to ask your question? Maybe, are you there? In that case, um, James, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I'll give it a go, Becky. Thank you very much, Hiral. Um, I Again, like Becky said, I really enjoyed how you employed, used Amory Moll there. I was really, really effective. Knowing a little bit about her work, and I think she manages to get multiple five, six, seven ontologies coming out of a leg or, or something like that. Um, how did you manage to keep your library to the three? I think you had the exhibit, the, ontol the exhibition ontology, and there was the other two. How did I, I'm kind of interested as a researcher? How did you stop that becoming tons and tons of ontologies, which libraries could do, I guess? Yes, and that goes back to the painful process that Becky was saying and it's it's a constraint of theorizing theorizing as well so it was a really messy difficult process of not sure what to do with all the data I have collected over one and a half years and like uh, Anne-Marie Mould says it's it's politics of which realities are being prioritized over others it's similarly applied in my research I prioritized the ontologies for which I had data I mean I could uh, go on for another six, seven years and get data for other ontologies, but that was the reality of it and that, that's the constraint. So, so prioritization based on the data that was available, both in terms of ethnographic access, but also survival in archives. Um, so so that's, uh, that's the thing. Um, and it was, uh, it was kind of my own interests as well. Um, and yeah, it, it is completely biased and sort of opportunistic in that way that, that this, um, I, def, I purposefully select, so book and uh, reading room were there from the beginning because I had lots of data. I purposefully went for exhibitions as an activist to a certain extent because I was really sad to see the practice of exhibition dying. And so I said, I need to add a chapter to make sure that this is being given attention. So again, it was biased in that way in driving my own agenda um, agenda here. Thank you. I'm gonna bring in Lutman and then I'm gonna, I can see a question from Jim and then we're gonna move on. So apologies if I've missed anybody else. Hi, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, so con talking about the access and the secured place, uh, you made mention of how uh, when student comes to the library, you know, they have this security pose that afterwards, you know, to make sure that you are not taking something out. But something quite interesting that I did a research, uh, a quite simple research back in uh, Sheffield Alam University, where how do you 
kind of find the link between creating the same access and security and also trying to prevent materials that are very important for students from getting it. For instance, you, you, you go to the library and there is this uh, kind of place cured, which is not, you know, open for the public or even to assess it, you need a security clearance. So how did you find a link between that? I think they are quite interlinked because if you have the materials secured, then in a way that would be useful for, for public and students. Um, when I was uh, interviewing the librarians, I found a lot of interesting creative ways in which books were stolen. Uh, and I, I don't want to spread those practices, but um, it, it is really interesting how um, creative people can get to overcome that boundary that the library was trying to protect some. So, so, but, uh, but, but yeah, in, in a way it's, um, the, I think the bigger issue here is um, whether the library is for staff and students of the university or whether it is for the public. And a lot of libraries have got a, a prioritization, rightly so, that our first audience is staff and students, and these are the communities we are going to prioritize. Um, however, um, the, 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 there are certain departments within library, like special collection and archives, are, are really open and focused towards engaging with the public. So again, a library is quite heterogeneous in that sense. Uh, so it would want to protect its study spaces and key textbooks for students so that they can access it during exam times uh, when the, there is high demand for that. But then equally, there are uh, aspects of libraries which are kind of outward facing and uh, want to engage with the public. So in a way, it's, it's kind of, um, a, a contradiction and very much aligned with Henry Mole that different versions of the library sort of hang together or con contrast with each other and it's a negotiation and it's it's kind of um, a, a politics in a way of which version is being leveraged at what time. Um, yeah, I don't know, Luke, if if this uh, uh, an answer. Yes, yes, it it does, but. For instance, you just made mention of the public. You made a clear distinction between the public trying to assess certain information in the student. So for instance, if students wants to assess certain information and this same information are kind of protected from the students, how, did, you, did you kind of find any link with that? How students were maybe complaining about not being able to assess certain information? No, I didn't uh, find any of that, to be honest, in my, in my work. Um, all the students were fairly happy with online access if that's what fitted with their routines and their, their discipline. And um, I mean, students were, rather than I think access to information, it was access to space, with, which is what they complained about, is that there were times during the year when you can't, cannot find a study desk. So that was more of a concern, but in terms of books, I, I, didn't, I don't recall any, any of my participants sort of uh, being unsatisfied. Thank you. I, um, I know Jim has a question and he's offered to contact you directly, Harald, but or equally we might have time to come back to that at the end, Jim. So I'm going to um, thank you very, very much um, and bring uh, James and Layla in, please. Thanks, Becky. Just going to start sharing screen. I put a round of applause emoji up then, just as you said, James and Layla. It was actually for Haral, just to be clear. Um, am I, is that, is that working? Are you seeing my slides? Yes. Yeah. Fab. And do you see a yellow screen now? Yes. Right, sorry, our slides. Um, welcome, folks. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to Part of the Furniture. Um, I'm, well, thank you to Becky and to Luke for inviting us, and to Haral for, um, for, a, for a great presentation just then. I'm James Kratso, I work at Shefford Hallam, teach on the graphic design course here. I'm also the teaching and learning lead in art and design. I research design education and particularly design studios. 
Yeah, likewise. Hi, everybody. And um, yeah, thanks again, Becky and Luke, for, for having us along. Um, I'm Leila Garib. I'm, I'm a PhD student at Sheffield Hallam, and my research is currently looking at the um, decolonisation of, of design education. Thanks, Leila. So um, our abstract for this talk had a um, uh, had some minor notoriety and um, actually ended up getting featured in this um, edition of Private Eye. We made it, we actually made it into, that is our abstract, in Sood's Corner in Private Eye. So um, we can now declare that we are, um, what's the word, intellectually pretentious, officially. Um, now, we learned a long time ago in art school that if anyone calls you pretentious, you need to go to Brian Eno. This is Brian Eno. Um, Brian Eno has got some very wise things to say about pretension. Um, in fact, this is one of the things he says. A common assumption is that there are real people and there are others who are pretending to be something they're not. There is also an assumption that there's something morally wrong with pretending. My assumptions about culture is a place where you can take psychological risks without incurring physical penalties. Make me think that pretending is the most important thing to do. It's the way we make our thought experiments, find out what it's like to be otherwise. And those, those, that last sentence really is also a really lovely way of talking about what the design studio can do or does. Uh, in, in art school. Um, the studio gives us permission to imagine a world uh, as it might be, to imagine alternative versions of things, to explore those and to do that critically. Without studio, our ability to kind of think about these alternatives would be very limited. Now, understanding studio is important, partly because of those kinds of things, but it's also really frustrating. Um, it's frustrating because it's necessarily complex, difficult to study, arouse just, uh, you know, spoken, you know, to the complexities of looking at space and all those things. The studio, maybe like the library, is human, it's messy, it's material, it's a milieu, it's an incomplete and contradictory one as well. Yeah, and we, and we realise that for, for some of you, the design studio won't be a place that you, you're familiar with or you know very well, so we, we do have a small vignette of a typical design studio that I'll talk you through. So she begins walking through the space, gesturing that you should follow. You assume she'll head for the desk roughly midpoint along one wall where she can call the class to order, but that is not what she does. As several more students arrive, she nods to them and then begins stopping at one workspace after another, spending several minutes each time and speaking with one or more of the students. She quickly pivots to the topic of whatever the students are working on. You note that each of these short discussions is different. In some, she probes for a status report on how the work is coming along and what problems are cropping up. In others, a student will immediately present her with a dilemma and either seek advice or talk about the approach they plan to take forward for resolving the problem. Issues range from technical to logistical to conceptual, which does not seem to phase Lara. After a while, you think you know why. She almost never has to know the answer to their questions. She asks them what they might do, what they're trying to accomplish, and how they can think about a problem differently. Often she seems to be genuinely puzzled herself and trying to work out a decision together with the student. Is she even teaching? Yeah, is she even teaching? Um, that vignette captures a typical design studio unfolding there. And I think that the, the reason we're sharing, one of the reasons we're sharing that with you is the thing we really want you to hold there is this idea of the moving tutor. The tutor moving from desk to desk, from student to student. So our study is um, really about us wanting to understand what it feels to be like um, in the studio. And we were interested in that in a kind of, in, in, in an embodied sense, in a spatial sense, and in an everyday sense. Um, I guess we were, we were interested in thinking about studio at the intersecting, at the intersection of these, of these kind of elements here, quite big quite a big intersection really. Um, particularly, um, we, we were interested in the perspectives of design tutors, design students, and, and also things. Today, we're gonna to be sharing part of the data we collected and part of our analysis from the perspectives of both tutors, but also where possible 
things. We want to take the role of things in education as seriously as we can, I guess, here. Um, and that's, you know, partly as, as, as uh, Hirao has, has shown us really, and as, as Lucy Suchman talks about as well, this idea that objects are not innocent, but fraught with significance for the relations that they materialize. So to set the scene of the, the complex studio space uh, that we're discussing, again, I'll, I'll read a description of, of this particular studio. So this large open plan design studio houses 100 final year graphic design students. All of their teaching takes place in this space and is overseen by a staff team whose offices are located nearby. Occupying a significant part of the studio are sets of tables and chairs facing in different directions. In one corner, there is a formal arrangement of chairs laid out in rows and facing a large screen. Stacks of additional chairs line the walls. There are bookshelves, pieces of equipment and computers. Two photocopiers and a row of large metal drawers to store paper. The surface is covered in a jumble of offcuts, books, pencils and cutting mats. The studio is full of things, things on walls, tables, shelves, half-made things, some stored, some abandoned and some in progress, although it's not always easy to discern which. There is a kitchen area with a fridge, microwave and tea making. Against one wall are a pair of green sofas, arranged in an L shape around a coffee table on a rook. So yeah, at this point, we'd, we'd like to briefly discuss our positionality as researchers in this project. So whilst undertaking this research over a number of years, my, myself and James had different kinds of uh, fluid relationships with the space from teaching in it to learning in it to visiting it. So therefore building on, on Hull's idea of, of black market knowledge or understandings he has accumulated in the field, we recognise and acknowledge that our understanding of the space comes with a level of familiarity as we have both experienced this space as, as an insider, as well as that um, outside of research position. Thanks, Leila. Um, I'm going to say a tiny bit about our, our approach to how we went about researching this space. Um, so as we've kind of already said, really, we wanted to kind of understand to some extent what it feels like in a very embodied and spatial sense to be, to be in that space. So I guess ethnography was was always going to be part of um, how we might approach it. But also at the same time, we didn't really have the resources to um, spend time following or walking around there with people. Um, and as insider researchers, I think to some extent that was also a complicated um, thing to have done. So we used this notion of uh, ethnographic mapping. Um, so just to say a little bit about that. Um, Practically, what happened was that we interviewed five tutors. Um, we interviewed them at the end of a teaching day in the space that they'd been teaching. Um, and they were given a large sheet of paper and they were asked to map out the space in the first instance. And then they were asked to trace the journeys that they'd made throughout the day on, on that piece of paper. And as they were tracing those journeys, we were interviewing them um, and asking about kind of things that were going on in that moment. Um, what is potentially powerful about ethnographic mapping is the way that these lines in place our participants back into that space in that moment. Um, it's as Ingold calls it that gestural reenactment. And um, in a way it allowed us to focus the interviews on um, or, or to keep the, keep the interviews as a kind of embodied experience. We were, we were able to travel around those spaces with our participants. And we were able to stay on the kind of the mundane aspects of being in that space and the very much the bodily aspects of being in that space um, as well. Um, now, Sarah Pink, the ethnographer is quite critical of this idea of um, what, what she calls mapping out as in looking from above. Um, and as we all know, I guess, particularly in a group like this, mapping can flatten things, it can fix things, it can distort things. And Pink contrasts this idea of mapping out, of looking from above, with this idea of, of, of an ethnography as, as, as a way of kind of moving through and understanding how we move through environments. Um, what kind of interested us about an, uh, ethnographic mapping is that it, it kind of takes both those, it takes elements of both those things, or at least we think it does. 
and there is something about that gestural reenactment through through the participants showing where they moved as we have those conversations that kind of gave it gave it for us certainly a sense of moving through so in a way these maps have become ways um, for us to meander with the body that pees as well as the object that speaks. Yeah, so, so sticking with that idea of the, the object that speaks, um, we recognised that we had focused quite heavily on, on the human experience of this space with our mapping and, and felt that we needed to really return to, to our initial note of this study wanting to take seriously the role of things in educational practices. So to do this, we thought it would only be fair to also interview the sofa itself. So we sat down with them and had a conversation and invited them into the project as not just an object, but themselves a, a research collaborator. So the sofas are here with us today and they would like to introduce themselves. So welcome sofas. Um, would you like to describe yourselves for, for everyone listening? Well, it's a tricky question. I don't get a chance to look at myself very often, but I'm pretty geometric. I'm pretty rigid as well. I have this sort of slightly corporate lime green, mid-grey fabric. I'm kinda a two slash eight person sofa and I weigh a lot. I've been sat on by a lot of people over the past five to six years. Thanks for that sofa. It's, it's really great to have you along with us today. But um, before we get into the next part of this uh, presentation, it would be really useful um, to hear from you what a typical day in your life would look like. Obviously, I don't go anywhere. I can't move. I stay there so it's quiet a lot of the time. It's dark, then it's light. Perhaps on a typical day, around eight-ish a member of staff might walk in or maybe a student might come in and take advantage of the quietness. I sit in this really big space. A typical day might begin with someone sat on me early on in the day, perhaps on their laptop. They are kind of waiting but they are also getting things done but they are also waiting. As it gets closer to 10 o'clock, usually things start at 10. That's when a lot more activity starts to happen. Some people come straight in and make a beeline for me and sit on me. They start chatting with each other, getting their laptops out, picking up books, mostly talking social things. There might be a few people organizing the room, straightening things out, somehow restructuring the space in a way. I don't really know why they're doing that. As we get really close to 10, it suddenly fills up really quickly and it's generally the tutor people who are sat on me at first and then lots of people come into the room. Thank you. Um, I love that, tutor people. Um, so, so we're gonna focus on the tutor people now um, and say a little bit about what we learned from the ethnographic mapping interviews with the tutor people um, in this instance. Um, so, I mean, as the sofas told us, and in a way, as those maps showed us as well, the sofa in this space is a kind of, is a kind of a really key base, a point a point in which so uh, in which the tutors put themselves on. If you think back to that vignette we had earlier on, the idea of Lara the tutor moving through that space from student to student, from desk to desk, that's not what seems to be happening in this space. That the, 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 the presence of the sofa, to some extent, renders the tutor, tutor immobile. Um, however, we wanna resist any notions here of any form of laziness you know, when we think about sofas, we can think about couch potatoes really, really quickly, but not here. And I think, you know, quite seriously, we, we kind of want to emphasize this notion of a kind of an active form of sitting. So if these tutors are immobile, what, what is the purpose of this immobility in this space? What's going on here? Well, one of the first things that kind of becomes evident in the interviews is this idea of demonstrating autonomy. For this tutor, sitting on the sofa, is about trying to get the students to demonstrate their autonomy. Um, the students come to them rather than that tutor imposing themselves in the, in the student space. But we might ask ourselves, if autonomy is the purpose, why doesn't the tutor simply leave the studio? Well, it's because alongside this, this idea of sitting on the sofa as a form of retreat, there's also, the sofa is this really important platform in this space because it, it's, it's there to signal something really, really important, that concept of availability, that the tutor is available. This sofa is positioned in an exceptionally good spot for being seen, but also for seeing as well. Um, so 
why is this availability important? Why does this tutor need to be sitting in the space in that kind of way? Well, part of this we think arises out of the complexity of the design process itself. Um, studies of conversations around the design process or that happened during the design process have been des described as heterarchic communication. I had to practice that a few times. Heterarchic conversations um, are the kind of conversations that need to happen regularly, potentially at random, at unpredictable moments. Um, they can move in, in multiple directions and they often need or engage a diverse range of people. So this kind of, um, this, this tutor sitting in this space, this availability supports, we think, this kind of mode of conversation for students that are engaged in that complex design process. This hyper availability recognizes in part of that process. Um, interestingly, this idea of availability also came up in some of the students' accounts. Now, while we're not principally talking about those today, um, one of the students that we interviewed talked about the idea of, 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 of the tutors on the sofa as being a, at a kind of lifeguard post, which kind of invokes this really, um, it invokes this idea of the studio as a place you could potentially get into trouble. It's also a place perhaps to be watched it's also perhaps a place to be saved from time to time. So yeah, build, building on those notions of availability and the heterarchic conversations that need to happen often and at random in the design process, we can move on to discuss the role of comfort and softness in creating space for those interactions. If the design process is uncomfortable, particularly when learning, however, this unpredictability, this uncomfort of the process was somehow made comfy or at least comfier by the sofa. And we propose that existing and creating in a studio space is in itself an act of vulnerability and argue that comfort is required in order for vulnerable studio practices to unfold. And we begin to see this in, in tutors' accounts of the sofa space and how they allude to a level of ease that is felt by both tutor and student to have conversations where ideas and objects are, are shared and, and passed between. And yeah, I guess that leads us into informality that, that's at play within the studio as a result of the, the sofa's presence. So through comfort, we, we arrive at the informal and we found that informalities radiate in the studio, um, partly because of the sofa and the way people interacted with, with that as a space. So one account from a tutor spoke about the importance of, of conversations and informality and how they had felt they had missed out on a lot of those moments of, of conversation in their own education because of the typical um, distance relationship between educator and student. Um, and the sofa has a quite profound effect on, on those notions of distance and, you know, invites people closer into a more intimate setting and, and begins to create the space for, for different kinds of conversations. And it also becomes this space that's disconnected from evaluation. This disconnect or, or this shift away from formal teaching allowed for more vulnerable conversations, more in-process conversations to happen. There was a sense that the informality created because of the sofa somehow allowed students to feel slightly less precious about sharing their work and ideas. So building on the idea of the of loss of uh, preciousness and sharing the sofa, unlike timetable tutorials didn't form to any sort of schedule. Um, so perhaps the, the formal conversations or, or the real teaching or the proper tutorial happened elsewhere but um, the sofa's allowed for something else, something more informal, perhaps even something more real. And, you know, really our last point is, is around this notion of realness. Now, maybe it's because sofas come with all sorts of cultural connotations, the, the domesticity, informality, sloth, relaxation, etc. that our participants were very conscious um, of what sitting on a sofa during a teaching session might look like to others. Um, the sofa doesn't meet prescribed versions or sitting on a sofa in a teaching session doesn't meet prescribed versions of teaching. It doesn't even do that in art and design teaching, um, generally speaking. Um, it doesn't look like real teaching, but we found in our participants this, this real conviction that the kind of exchanges that could happen in those spaces were in a way maybe somehow more real and somehow more authentic. Um, here, this tutor describes the idea of getting to the bottom of what somebody is about. 
um, and that somehow that 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 is is the key for creative practice potentially. Um, we wonder really. We might say that the sofa here acts a little like Sherry Tuckle's idea of the marginal object. The marginal objects draw attention to where the lines are drawn. Marginal objects kind of can uh, affirm lines, and they can kind of um, they can call into question lines. And the kind of lines that we want to call into question here, or we think the, this kind of emerging study is showing us, is the lines between what constitutes real teaching um, and and not teaching the lines between action and inaction, between formal and informal, uh, between the cognitive tutor and the embodied tutor, and the lines between learning as a product of something you do with people and learning as a product of something you do with things or in thing-people relations as well. Yeah, thanks for that, James. So I guess now we'd just like to summarise the main points raised through, through those findings. So firstly, we begin to see the work of the sofa alongside the tutors to be an act of legitimizing informality. So the sofa materialized the possibility for informality, but there was a feel amongst the, the sofa and the tutors that the, there must be a, an element of resistance against any attempts for this informality to become officially subsumed. As an informal space, it cannot by definition become part of a formal repertoire of teaching because then it would cease to function as an informal encounter. So we've tried to show you how the sofa with, with the tutors in this setting generates just enough liminality for those two modes to coexist and for tutors and students to be able to move between these modes in a quest to make enough room for students' authentic selves to become part of their work. And through those informalities, the sofa and its radiating softness repattern teaching and learning. The typically mobile tutor becomes immobile as a result of the stationary sofa providing the space in which autonomy must be demonstrated. Moreover, the once hard to find tutor living in an office somewhere becomes the hyper available tutor always on the sofa. So with the idea of hyper availability in mind, we also recognize the limitations of these informal encounters. They not only require constant tutor presence, but also the student to be in the studio in order for these conversations to, to occur. Um, and the sofa exudes a, a certain type of domestic familial presence in the space, which for some we, we agree can be comforting, but we're also quite critical of this and, and recognize that comfort in itself can, can be subjective. Um, and this constant presence needed by all parties may be to cloying for some a watery space that it might, you know, might be hard to navigate. Um, so therefore, I guess we're asking ourselves who is missing out on these informal moments because of the conditions uh, required to achieve them. So yeah, on that note, <laughs> myself, James and the sofa would like to, to thank you for having us along and yeah, we'll be happy to answer any of your questions, all three of us. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much, Leila and James, that was great. Um, I can see a really interesting question in there from Shona. Um, I, I would like to ask first, uh, you touched on this at the end, Leila. Um, so casualness or apparent casualness is a kind of code, isn't it, that can be kind of bo bohemian or, um, you know, a kind of performed uh, oppositionality or resistance. And I, I wonder, you, you know, is it harder for some people, for some people to learn sofa more than others. So are there, you know, I was wondering about the intersection of class and ethnicity and disability and how that might inform the degree to which um, informality can be understood as productive. Yeah, really, really interesting question. We, we've had some conversations um, about things like that and like you know the whole idea of comfort being subjective and informality being subjective as well and the sofa in itself being quite a, a western concept of, of an idea of comfort so yeah I guess those takeaway critical comments that we're starting to think about is is how is that space configured in a way you know whose identities are privileged in in those spaces and and how we can begin to think of that, but I don't know if you have any other comments, James. 
I mean, I think it's a really fair point. Just to, just to add a couple more things to that, and, and we weren't able to put it in here, but the sofa was used in very different kinds of ways at different times of the day. You know, sometimes there would be students sleeping on them. So there was different kinds of informal relationships that were taking place. I think the other thing, and I, I, I hope it's come through, is, is the work the staff were doing to use that. You know, this, isn't, this wasn't a passive kind of lounging um, come to me it was it was a very active strategy you know which took a while to sort of notice how that was working now studio is always unfortunately has dimensions of 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 not including everyone i don't i don't think people have found a version of studio that is inclusive yet i think you're right to say informality can present another set of exclusions we haven't got the other side of that really becky but it's a it's a very fair comment it, it, it wasn't an accusation it was i was just interested in 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 the, those contexts how how that change happens or um you know yeah how do you learn so far if if there are i mean i was thinking particularly about um in pgr my neck of the woods we have a lot of international students and they have um really um you know they hold us in a greater deal of performed respect than our um you know born British students do uh, and we have to kind of you know and I think in the supervisor student relationship you know an over deferential role can stop stuff happening so you're kind of you're, so, you're sort of trying to um you know restructure hierarchy and I can see that that's what this does but at the same time as trying to restructure it it there are other hierarchies I, you know I, I, I um it's not a criticism, it's just a really interesting thing about how you learn the informality is productive and not allow it to replicate other cultural hierarchies or yeah, absolutely. I mean, just 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 because we're talking about informalities, what is really interesting, and it's not just in this studio with a sofa, but I think we think this is a phenomenon that happens certainly in design education, is this we called it elsewhere, this idea of structuring informality. So very, very deliberate strategies, perhaps in art as well as design, to, to generate all kinds of informalities, which can be both material as well as social or social material. That there seems to be something about the disciplinary knowledge practices, which I think is what you're getting at, Becky, that requires those levels of informality as well. But yeah, but other things get structured back in, don't they? Absolutely. Thank you. Um Sinead, you've got a great question there. Would you would you be okay to ask it yourself? Say it out loud. Yeah, no problem. That was uh, really interesting, James and Layla. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, I, I was just genuinely interested if this would apply to other disciplines. So obviously, it it, it lends itself. The studio the practice lends itself to art and, and design. But are there other disciplines that can learn from this? Um, so in terms of engagement with students and active learning, um, you know, do you think this could be applied across the board? Do you think that that would be a desirable thing to do? Uh, if so, you know, how do, how do we kind of get that message out? Go on, you can go. Okay. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't have a... I have definitely seen a paper, Sinead, where something not dissimilar to this was applied. I can't remember whether it's educational studies, it might even have been maths. I mean, even our even the maths department here at Shefford Hallam employs a studio teaching method. So, you know, that there are kind of like, yeah, I'm sure there are examples. Um, I do think there is something about, I mentioned the idea of the disciplinary knowledge practices. So the nature of how knowledge is made and con constructed, you know, Design studios are, are built on the idea of social constructivist learning. So it's kind of co-emergent learning, or at least in its most ideal form. I don't know enough about other disciplines, but from the studies I've done about the difference between disciplines, the different kind of knowledge structures might make some aspects of this more difficult. Studio as a concept, whether sofa as a concept, I don't know, but studio as a concept doesn't translate always automatically into other places. We think because it's such a complex site that even as people that have been working in them for years, we can't explain <laughs> everything that's going on. So it's not an easy site to sort of take and, and put somewhere else. 
Um, yeah, so I'm really sitting on the fence there, Sinead. That's okay, James. Yeah, I think um, actually here all has just um, said the question that, that came to my mind next, which was the, the kind of adjacent spaces. So if, if the discipline requires a, a specialist laboratory space or something like that, where is there value and power in adjacent spaces, which which speak more to this kind of informality um, and engagement with students? But uh, I think, Carol, you've, you've put it much better than I have. Uh, did you yeah. want to? Yeah, Thanks. sorry, Harald, go. No, uh, really interesting uh, work, and it is so relevant because now the whole emphasis is shifting post COVID on social learning spaces. Um, and there is, a, there is a kind of a divide, so to say, in terms of how we conceptualize uh, the campus spaces, so the formal classroom timetabled spaces, and then the corridors, the foyers, the sort of untimetabled spaces. Or, uh, and the, there we often find uh, sofas and a lot of comfy furniture. Um, and there was a comment uh, in, in the chat where there were bean bags, for instance. Uh, and I was wondering, and at, at the end, I think Leila mentioned that the sofa in this situation worked because of the presence of the tutors and the students and it being part of the learning experience. Um, we often find the sofas in the corridors and sort of landing areas, sort of not having that sort of experience or, or energy or the feeling. Um, and I was wondering whether you had any reflections on sofas you find outside uh, sort of um, the teaching areas, to say. Yeah, Sinead, do you want to go? Well, Lela's thinking. I can see Lela's thinking really <laughs> hard about that. Um, I, I, uh, I read a fascinating paper which talked about the concept of lounge space as the kind of like the most ubiquitous slash terrifying concept that's sweeping through, uh, I think the Western world, I think is how they kind of judged it. It's like the, the emblematic 21st century concept. That was it. I'm not saying sofas in corridors are necessarily lounge space, but I don't really feel qualified personally to speak about how they work. But what I do know and the, and the really important point here is really is the nature that this is a totally layered space here. The, the, this, this, is, this, is, this is the site in which students did all, nearly all of their kind of on-campus learning. So this sofa sat in this space, it was within that space. It wasn't a kind of adjacent dropout breakout space. It was kind of, it almost became the front. Studios don't have a front really, but maybe that sofa was the closest thing to a front temporarily for that period. Mm -hmm. Uh, I so think that's going back sorry, in. Sorry, Leila, um, from Jim there. Uh, um, uh, was it Jim? Sorry, yeah, about, about yeah, the, the corporate sofa. I'm really sorry. I want to just move on slightly. Um, if you don't mind, uh, we can maybe come back. There's a great question. Luke wants to add something. There's a great question from Justine there. I wonder if she might ask it and then move on to her, uh, to their presentation. Luke, do you want to do that first and then we'll go? Uh, yeah, very, very quick comment from me, just to say that this um, this whole emerging question that's just been tabled is, is sort of really showing the ghost in the room, which is that if Carol Taylor had been here today, she would have been perfectly placed to talk about um, corridors and other marginal spaces and the way in which learning and research and interaction is, is fed, fueled. Uh, uh, manipulated and, and warped by um, corridors and so on and so forth. Um, that was very much going to be the gist of her paper. So, so uh, in part, hold this question for um, Changing Campus 3, possibly in May, uh, where we can pick the threads up again then. Thank you. Uh, Justine. Okay, thanks. So my, my question, or, or it wasn't even a question really, I was just sort of pondering, um, whether there is a, a digital equivalent of the sofa um, in relation to sort of online teaching and learning and, and, and what that might look like and indeed what kind of voice it might have. I was very interested to hear that your voice had, so your sofa had such an electronic voice. I was expecting it to be sort of softer somehow. Um, but I wondered if you had any thoughts about that digital sofa. Leila, did you want to come in in relation to the other paper that we wrote, which sort of may speak to that slightly? Yeah, so we, we did write a paper during the pandemic of, of this whole idea of um, 
you know, students' accounts of, of studio pre-pandemic with, within this space that we've been speaking about today, but then we also put that alongside them. So we did interviews with students during during the, the pandemic and, and it was interesting to see how with all of the maps that we, we started to show of the studio, we also, we did that with um, the maps that they were then working in at home. And it was this this whole flattening of, of these informalities that were just no longer present anymore, which I think, you know, starts to get at, at some of the importance of these moments of informality, because once they were taken out of that space, it, it left very little room for, for those informal, more spontaneous encounters. So I don't think we've found a, a digital version of the sofa yet, but um, yeah, I don't know if you've had anything, James, about that. No, we tried really hard. The, yeah. the closest we got to, we tried a thing called spatial chat, which was sort of supposed to mimic the idea. But it was, it was. Uh, I can see my colleague Joe nodding in horror. It was a horrific experience. It was a total failure. Um, no, I think we haven't yet found if it's possible. Yeah, how that might work. It's a great question, though. Justine, would you like to um, give us an insight into your new work? Yes, certainly. And um, although I can't, I have no claim to fame, such as your um, your uh, feature in Sood's Corner um, of Private Eye, which I thought was was brilliant. Um, but I have to confess to be feeling a little bit of imposter syndrome after after the last two presentations. Um, I, I and uh, Sinead is, is also involved in this. And sorry, I'll share my screen while I'm talking. Is um, we're coming at this very much from a, a practical a, a practitioner basis I guess so I probably am not using the same sort of research terminology or, or um, what have you that we've used before my only concession to that is I thought I'd better have a fancy name um, for for my presentation so I've chosen variety is the condition of harmony which is a Thomas Carlyle quote um, and um, I just wanted to give a bit of explanation about where this has come from. So not, sorry, not the Thomas Carlyle quote, but the fact that we were looking at students' thoughts on Helen's teaching and learning spaces. So um, many of you will be aware, those of you from Helen, that we are at the start of a very ambitious campus plan, which will see a number of new buildings, some major refurbs and um, consolidation of our two campuses onto the one city campus um, and the first phase of that is underway on the old science park site at the moment and then alongside that we've got the extended campus and you'll see from this slide here that I'm the program lead for that um, program extended campus and I work very closely with Sinead um, on that um, and within that program we're looking at we're, we're focused on understanding how we want to use our digital and physical infrastructure and what changes might be needed to that infrastructure, but also to our practice in order to realise the benefits of any improved infrastructure. So um, with an aim to providing learning, working, social environments that are better aligned to the needs of our staff and students and also um, enable us to uh, perform more efficient operations, I guess. So one of the things that we were anxious to do was to make sure that the student voice was, was heard in that. Um, and so we've set up this campus experience student board, which um, is intended to provide student input into planning, design and development of future campus developments. Um, so as to maximize those benefits from the experience of the student. So that board is chaired by myself and also Scarlett Parr, who is one of the student union um, officers. And we've got nine students on that board who we've tried to, as far as possible, get a mixture of levels of study, modes of study. We've got international representation, commuting students. And we've tried for those with protected characteristics, but that was harder to recruit to. Um, and we've also got a number of staff members across uh, those areas of professional services that you can see there. So um, the things that we're going to be looking at or are looking at with this board, you can see here. So we're looking at um, what students think about the sort of operational elements, the hygiene elements, if you like, of the campus. 
the teaching and learning spaces, what works and what doesn't work. Um, our next session is looking at the campus plan itself. And then we'll be looking, we'll be focusing in more on catering and campus services. Um, what we've called the sticky campus, which I recognise is quite an outdated phrase now, but is one that resonated with the students actually, which is why we've kept it in our communications with them. And then also looking at the student digital journey. So in order to, we were, I was really interested, I didn't make it to your last session, but I am halfway through the recording and I was really interested to hear the um, presentation from the person from UWE. Um, and in fact, as I, as I was listening to that, I thought, oh, why on earth did I not think of using Instagram? That would be a brilliant idea. And then as I went further through that presentation, I noticed that she said the students really didn't engage in Instagram at all. So that was really interesting. Um, but we chose a similar um, approach, um, which uh, this photo elucidation technique to try and understand the how the students, I think Hiral said this earlier, how the students are actually experiencing those learning spaces. So not just um, are they performing as we expected them to do, but what are the students thinking about them? And we decided that the best way to do this is to get them to take photos of the spaces. So not for us to prescribe which spaces they use for teaching or, or, or study, but for them to take pictures of the places that they want to talk to us about. Um, we asked, we gave them a, a PowerPoint template, which they could upload their photographs to and um, asked them to give a caption to each one. We gave them a number of headings. So what type of space it is, where it is, why and how they used it, whether they thought it was suitable for that activity and who else was in the proximity. And then they uploaded it to, to OneDrive. And then we had a meeting where they came along and we, we discussed uh, the images that they provided. So four of the nine students returned photos, three were city, largely city, and one was uh, largely collegiate. And then Scarlett led a discussion um, where the students showed their slides and then talked about the reasons they chose those images and um, answered a few of the uh, questions that we'd asked on the template. Um, the other students did contribute to that discussion, bringing their experience into that and their percep perceptions into that. Um, some of that was prompted by Scarlett or other staff members in the meeting, but others were just um, coming directly from the students themselves. And I just wanted to share a selection. I'm just going to whiz through these, but I just wanted to show a selection of the of the kind of images that they gave to us. And it was quite interesting that they took different approaches as well. So this student provided a number of collages um, of different uh, different spaces that she talked through and the same uh, with the new atrium space. But then others took um, single, single photos um, and um, talked us through those. There's a rather arty one there with um, using the, the portrait on, on her camera. Um, uh, one of the hub space, various cafe spaces, there's the collegiate heart of the campus space. Um, and that's a resources room in Norfolk, I believe. And the the H, uh, the, uh, the atrium, which I can never say, in the uh, STEM centre. So we uh, spent some time talking through these, and as I say, um, the students themselves talked to the images, and other um, students chipped in with their experiences. And this was only last Wednesday, I should say, and so I've. Um, hurtled to put this together around other commitments, but these were some of the key things coming out of that, I think. And you'll see the first one, um, which is, is not all that surprising, um, but I think what really, really came through was the, was the um, idea that, you, that we need a variety of spaces, partly because there are a wide variety of learning activities and study activities happening in those spaces, but also because there's such um, a difference in individual preference. And what is useful and conducive for one student is not for another. So for instance, there was a picture of the bottom of the new atrium. And some students were experiencing that space as airy and uncluttered 
and um, conducive for work. Whereas another student said that she really disliked it because she felt overlooked. Um, she felt like she was in a gladiator pit is actually the term that she used. Um, and she much preferred finding the, the small, cozy, out of the way spaces. Uh, we had other students who said that um, what was important to them was absolute quiet. So they really needed that, those sort of quiet spaces to, um, to concentrate in. Whereas others said they found it really hard to work in quiet spaces and they wanted some sort of bustle and background um, noise in order to study effectively. Um, I think we just touched on this quite a bit in the last presentation, but this, I've, I've called them in-between spaces. So these are those spaces we were talking about, about sofas in the corridors or, um, you know, small booths in, in various out-of-the-way places. These were very, very popular with the students and um, they would like to see a lot more of these spaces on campus where they can just touch down. Um, but sorry, just jumping one down, but if we were to provide more of those spaces, we would have to ensure that we had good wireless um, connectivity and a ready power supply. Um, obviously access to various re resources. So um, this included things, so especially software and equipment, uh, facilities like printing, but also staff. So, um, in a number of spaces that we looked at, the presence of academic um, staff was incredibly important, um, but also the technical staff that, that came up time and time again, having access to the technical staff was really key to, to some students' ability to study, and also the library staff on, on hand to provide expertise and support. Um, so I think, um, uh, sorry, just moving on a bit. So um, the conducive environment for study was also uh, things like the temperature. Natural lighting came up time and time and time again. Um, students were saying that they are able to concentrate far better in natural lighting or conversely, uh, we had some pictures of um, some of the rooms in EMB uh, and the students were saying that they, they tired quickly and they lost concentration in those rooms where there's no natural lighting and it's all artificial light. Cleanliness came up several times as well, um, and safety. So a sort of psychological safety, I think, as well as personal safety. So I think um, when, when talking about cafes, several of the students were talking about um, the presence of other people, making them feel safe, making them feel motivated. Um, one of them mentioned that working with unknown students and staff around them helps with their motivation and productivity. So I thought that was very interesting observation. Uh, and one of the things that came out of this is that the students would find it very helpful to know the totality of spaces across campus, which I guess would be quite difficult if we were talking about developing more of those in-between spaces. But um, being able to know what spaces were available what facilities were in those spaces and what kind of environment they might find within those spaces. Um, and then how they would find them. And I think that was particularly useful for um, first year students who haven't necessarily got the same um, knowledge and understanding of the campus. And then we began, but didn't finish, we ran out of time, but a really fascinating discussion about whether um, spaces should be discipline badged or open to all. And I think that led us into a kind of discussion about how spaces make people feel uh, that they belong and um, reflect their identity, uh, as opposed to how that how having all badge spaces or how particularly badge spaces might therefore lead to excluding others from their use. Um, and the other way we looked at that is um, whether you had permission to go into those spaces or needed permission to go into those spaces or whether you felt there was a prohibition and those spaces were not for you. So I think there's a, a considerable amount of, of unpacking that we'd like to do in that area. So um, we are using this information to inform the state's campus planning. 
But we're also feeding some of this into extended campus programme projects. So that wayfinding, that um, learning commons, we've been calling it description tool and wayfinding, may well find itself into as, as a project in extended campus. But I was also reading in Wonky, and I, I don't know if other people saw this, about the um, ORD report, Campus Space and Places, Impact on Student Outcomes. And there was a call there um, for people to, uh, to get involved in, in the next stage of that project. And Sinead and I were, were just at an early stage of discussing how we might possibly contribute to or, or benefit from, um, from that project. And then sort of a call out to people on, in, in this um, event, really, as to whether there is, uh, whether there's interest in partnering on some form of um, internal research project um, arising from some of these studies. So as I said, that was a, a massive canter through. Uh, it was very rushed, um, but I hope that gives a flavour of where we have got to so far. That was in incredibly interesting, Justine. And it uh, really, you know, it picks up some of the connections with um, uh, Harriet's work last time. Um, and um, so, um, but also pulls at it in different ways through some of the, the, the language that you've used to summarize, you know, just using permission um, and that and prohibition, uh, interesting, stronger words than Harriet said. Um, I it, really helpful and really interesting. So thank you very very much. It's great you were able to come. Um, we are getting tight for time. I don't want to run over, but I'm really keen to see if anybody has any questions for Justine or wider questions or things you'd like to pull out. Uh, Jason. Yeah, I was going to ask about you know I've noticed you know around the university, a lot of the cafe outlets have closed or been closed through COVID and they don't seem to be opening up as we start to open up. To open up. And I think, you know, being in those environments where it feels a lot unsafer because there isn't anyone around that's been pulled out in that, are those places going to be opening up? Because they, you know, they sort of double up as security as well as a social space. Will, will more of them become back into general use or what's happening with buildings around that? Because is slightly worrying about how buildings have just been areas where people transition into and out of, and there's nothing going on to keep people within that environment. I think that's a really, really great question, Jason. And I think um, it's one of the things that we would like to see a bit more sort of holistic thinking about. I think that there's a tendency sometimes within the university and, and for good reasons, but to just look at cafe outlets, outlets as, um, as, a, as a commercial operation. Yeah. Whereas in actual fact, we know that they're much broader than that. We know there are places where people want to congregate and meet. And the students um, frequently say that they like to work in university cafes, and this might, this might show the, the tension, but they like to work in university cafes because they feel they belong there and they don't feel the need to have to continually purchase as they might if they were working in a, in a cafe off campus. So you can see there that there's a, there's a tension there with the, with the commercial need to, for, for the outlet to kind of um, wash its face, if you like. But I think if we could I think, I think if we could take a different view towards these kind of outlets and see their multiplicity of use, then we might take a different approach to how we evaluate their success, I guess, not just a purely commercial basis. But, um, but I don't have an actual answer to your question, Jason. Uh, I mean, that I think that's just something we need, to, we need to keep discussing. I mean, that's fine. I mean, because the other thing I noticed is that, that one thing I, I'd miss going back on campus is that all the informal conversations I had with staff, especially when I was based in Stoddart, and all that knowledge you build up, that, you know, that informal capital has also disappeared. And you can't quantify that through any sort of metrics. And I, but I think it's so value, valuable to the university experience. Absolutely. I've just experienced it myself. I'm in Furnival Works today. Yeah. Um, I've just bumped into a colleague that I haven't actually met in person because he joined, you know, during the during the pandemic. And we've just had a brief chat and I've, I've worked, 
I found out he's doing his dissertation on hybrid working, which is a part of our extended campus plan. So we've agreed to meet. And, you know, but I wouldn't have known if I hadn't walked in today. No, brilliant. Just a comment. Um, uh, I um, um, I have seen something really interesting, independent, in, in, in different departments about what it means to reoccupy. Um, uh, you know, I feel like your comment, Justine, about a joined up conversation would be really good because, you know, in PGR, you know, PG, doctoral research has a funny relationship to space anyway. And we're having to kind of like really work a muscle to get our students to reoccupy places. And it means something different for a doctoral researcher than um, I, I put in the chat to Machen, the gallery manager, has been working with fine art students. And he has very strategically made the, a, a fine art show happen using the building in a different way that we've never used before. And he talks in this really good exhibition text about the problems, what it might mean to reoccupy. Um, so it, you know, I'm really interested in how the different disciplines, how that, you know, what, what, what we are, can see in the approaches to reoccupy, reoccupation might tell us something about what occupation was and what we want from occupation in really interesting ways. Yeah, I don't know if I want to bring Sinead in on, on this because um, Sinead sort of leads on the engagement element of, of extended campus. Um, and we have been talking recently about needing to develop a, a, a real program that leads us to engage right across the university. Um, so to, to explore those kind of um, issues that you're talking about there, Becky. I don't know if you want to bring anything in, Sinead. Well, only to say that we, we probably don't have time to talk about it here, but it's, it's definitely one of those things that is, it's vitally important. It's not just about re reopening buildings. It's about re-engaging with people. Um, and I think most of the points in the chat kind of touch on that. So we, we want to, to kind of make that engagement as, as far reaching as, as we possibly can, given the, the constraints of resources. Um, and to Pamela's point, to include um, groups that are normally overlooked, including disabled staff and students, and um, make sure that people are, I suppose, in, engaged in a way that is meaningful for them. And it's not just discipline specific, it's, it's people specific as well. But yeah, we've, we've uh, for all very interesting topics, but more than, more than we have time for now, I think. Pamela, did you want to come in there? Because I'm, I'm really curious to know whether you're talking about the reoccupation of campus and disabled student experience. I think it's the whole thing. I'm a disabled member of staff, but I'm also a student, uh, you know, doing my doctorate. And I think what became very, very clear from lockdown onwards was the complete difference in the, in, of experience of students versus staff. Now, as a student, I get a specialist chair put in a room when I'm in class. As a member of staff, when I'm timetabled, I have repeatedly been put in a class with no chairs, expected to stand for six hours straight teaching with no area to go to because most of the cafes are not disabled friendly. They've got chairs with no backs, they've got wooden frames, they're not comfy to sit. So my experience is actually, as a member of staff, has been horrendous in lockdown. Um, I'm still waiting on a specialist chair at home two years later. And I've had two lots of surgery now because of the damage to my spine and my MRI scan before lockdown to what it was just before Christmas there shows that I have actually got damage to four more discs simply during lockdown. And that in itself to me has, has caused more problems than, than not. So for me, I think, yes, it's lovely when cafes look very a you know appeasing visually and they look very trendy but when you're actually discriminating against people being able to sit and use them for some people like myself with spinal problems that then becomes a problem it's it's simple things that people don't think about it's where you plug your laptop in it's too low for somebody that's disabled or in a wheelchair to bend down to get to it so si simple things like that can cause major major problems and for me, there's no joined up process at the moment. And I've even, even just last week, I've discovered my department has been relocated to a different building 
which means I'll be the only member of staff in my department that won't be with my department because of my disability. So that again is discriminatory practice simply by decisions with people not considering the thing. And what I commonly get said, what's commonly said to me is, well, you're the minority. There's only one of you, there's more of us. And, and to me, that in itself is, is not good, if you see what I mean. So for me, when we're looking at things like that, it's about the inclusion of everybody. And I wouldn't want to think that I discriminate against a student. Do you know what I mean? But it's worse when the, the, the journey is different between staff and students as well, because then you get a disparity and there's no, there's no joined up thinking. Yeah, I, I don't I, know what other people's experience is. I know in the staff forum, the disabled staff forum, some of us are getting really good experiences and our departments are really well supported, but there's others that are having such a bad experience where there's no joined up thinking across the board, if that makes sense. And that's that that causes problems in itself. I, I was just about to ask you about the, the staff network, actually, because we we are trying to engage through those staff networks. Um, but perhaps, I mean, obviously we, we've run out of time here, but perhaps we could pick some of this up outside of this meeting, Pamela, just to, because I am interested in the discrepancy between the, the departments and the experience that people in different departments are, yeah. are finding. I think it also really connects with something Haral said at the beginning about, about how ex ways of understanding experience do not connect up with places where change can happen. Uh, I think uh, you talked about estates not being included in certain processes. Um, I am going to wrap up um, because I don't want, you know, I want to sort of not be sitting here for much longer. Um, so it, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for those brilliant presentations. All three of them really insightful, uh, absolute delight. Um, I hope you will all join us for Changing Campus 3. So watch this space. Um, uh, so unless Luke, you want to add anything, uh, he's been conspicuously quiet. He's very out of character. Um, I, <laughs> um, I, I will close. So thank you all so much. Uh, absolutely brilliant afternoon. So thank you. Oh, it will be uh, available online. Uh, Luke will send a link around.